Hi, I'm Mitch and this is a video on combustion shock tube basic parts and operation. I have here a 3D model of a shock tube. Uh, this here is just the support structure for the shock tube. This is what we call a dead mass. I won't talk too much about that, but the shock tube is attached to that to prevent vibrations. And this is a laser table where we would set up all of our diagnostics. This is the shock tube and it consists of two basic sections the driver section and the driven section and during operate or right before operation the driver section and driven section are physically separated inside the tube by a sacrificial diaphragm and so this is the the diaphragm section way down here at the very end of the driven section is what we call the test section I should mention that this is a tube closed at both ends, so it's completely separated from the atmosphere. And so this test section is as close to this end wall as it can possibly be. And that's where we put all of our diagnostics. That's why we've got a laser table here. So if we just and uh, if we take a closer look at our test section, if we just zoom in on that, uh, what we've got our end wall here, and then we've got these diagnostic ports where we put um, windows for lasers, pressure transducers, and other things as close to that end wall as we can possibly get it. So now if we look at just a simple schematic of the shock tube. It's just a big long tube closed at both ends and we're going to go through several slides looking at how the pressure um, changes during the operation of the tube. You can see over on the right hand side here I've got my pressure scale and this won't change throughout the presentation so red is relatively high pressure uh, purple is relatively low pressure which is actually all the way down to more or less absolute vacuum, um, the vacuum of space, zero psi. And then somewhere in the middle we have atmospheric pressure. And the this scale changes depending on the test that you're running. Low pressure may not have to be the absolute vacuum and high pressure may be a few psi or it might be several hundred psi. Um, so I'm not going to put numbers on that. So we start our diagram here with the assumption that we just ran a test and filled the driver and driven back, uh, allowed the driver and driven section to exhaust back to atmosphere. So we have a broken diaphragm here, the driver and driven section are currently connected, and they're at atmospheric pressure. So the first thing that we need to do is install our diaphragm again. So we open up the tube, put in a sacrificial diaphragm, and close it back up. Then we need to draw the driver and driven section back down to absolute vacuum. Uh, we're getting these, we're pulling as many molecules as we possibly can out of this. The goal is to have basically zero molecules anywhere in either one of these. Um, and so what we're able to achieve practically is typically a vacuum pressure of about 5 times 10 to the negative 6th tor. For whatever reason, most vacuum gauges read in tor. If you're smart and you like SI units, uh, you, that 5 times 10 to the negative 6th tor is equivalent to about 6.7 times 10 to the negative 4th pascals. And if you're a crazy person who likes the uh, English system, you can assume that's 9.7 times 10 to the negative 8th psi. So that's 0 0.0000001 psi. Uh, is about what we can typically expect depending on how good your vacuums are. So now, um, once we've uh, pulled everything down, now we put just a little bit of reactant mixture in there. So we might uh, put up to a few tor, 10, 20, 30 tor in there. Uh, and that again depends on what your end conditions want to be. Typically, the reactant mixture that we fill this with is some fuel and some oxidizer. So, say, methane and air, or ethylene and oxygen. It doesn't have to be that. You could just put in a single type of gas, say ethylene, and say, I want to see how ethylene breaks down at high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. Uh, that would be called pyrolysis, or you might want to heat up some other type of molecule and study it at high temperature. Uh, but typically, it's, the rea it's going to be a reactant mixture of fuel and oxidizer that you're trying to cause combustion.
with. Um, and so that's the, the assumption we're going to move forward with here. Notice that these two driven and driver sections are now at a slightly different pressure, but the pressure differential across this diaphragm is just a few tor, so that's a few pascals, uh, and, and is not enough to burst the diaphragm. But we do want to burst that diaphragm, so the next thing that we're going to do is to begin, oopsie, the next thing that we're going to do is begin filling the driver with high pressure gas. This needs to be a non-reacting gas. Typically, you, we use helium. And we just keep putting that helium in and causing the pressure to go up. And now this is going to happen pretty fast because typically we just keep increasing the pressure until eventually the diaphragm breaks. So at, at some point, the pressure differential between the driver and the driven section gets so great that this sacrificial diaphragm can no longer hold it, and it bursts. And now I'd like to take just a moment to discuss some basic terminology. This blue low pressure, uh, which was the initial pressure that we measured after we put in our reactants uh, in the driven section, is called P1. Uh, the pressure of the driver section just as the diaphragm bursts is called P4. That seems a little bit odd that we would use a 1 and a 4, but give me a couple slides and, and it might start to make a little bit more sense. This is the standard uh, nomenclature. So we have a burst diaphragm, and now what we can expect is a shock wave moving from the left to the right because we've got a whole bunch of molecules at high pressure here and now that they're not constrained anymore, they want to go rushing down the tube in this direction. Well, if those molecules go rushing down the tube to the right, that means that we're going to have expansion back towards the left, and we call that a rarefaction wave. You can kind of think of a rarefaction wave as being the opposite of a shock wave. Rarefaction is expansion, shock wave is compression. And this particular shock wave we call the incident shock wave. So as that shock wave propagates down, the gas, the gas that was just shocked has an increase in pressure. And then you can see that this high pressure at P4 is slowly um, going down due to expansion. So if we follow that a little bit further down, now we have our original driven section pressure is P1. The gas that was just shocked by the incident shock wave is called P2. The gas that is expanding backwards into um, the driver section is at P3. And then the gas that has still not uh, expanded, that is at its original burst pressure, is called P4. And these states obviously remain for a few microseconds. This is, very, this is happening very quickly. So eventually that incident shock reaches the end wall and then reflects back off. And we... and we call that leftward moving shock the reflected shock and that shock heats the gas at the test section a second time up to what we call P5 so this state 5 here is our test condition so now we just leave that we just watch that shocked gas in our test section until we see evidence of ignition. There's a lot of ways that we can sense ignition that I'll talk about in a separate video, but eventually uh, this, this uh, reactant mixture of fuel and air has been heated and pressurized up to something that's going to cause them to react eventually. So we sat around and we waited for a small amount of time um, and eventually it reacted. And that reaction gives off heat, so that causes uh, the pressure to increase here in the test section one more time. Now remember that we have instrumentation ports in our test section. One of our pieces of instrumentation is a pressure transducer. And if we were to look at uh, a trace of that pressure transducer, remember it's measuring the pressure at this one spot over the course of time, that trace would look like this. Remember in our very first um, slide, the pressure was 
the, the color in the test section was blue, and that was at P1. Then that incident shock came past and shocked it up to a green state. That was P2. Then the reflected shock passed and brought it up to that teal color. That was P5. And now it has ignited, so we're at the ignition pressure. And so you can tell from this pressure trace when the incident shock has passed, when the reflected shock has passed, and when you have ignition. And so one of the tests that we can do in a shock tube is called the ignition delay time. And that is essentially the time between when the reflected shock has passed and we're up to our test condition at, at state 5 and the time between when we reach our test condition and when ignition starts. So how long do these reactants have to be in this state 5 before they finally decide to react? And state 5 is usually uh, maybe 1500 Kelvin, between uh, 700 and 2500 Kelvin typically, and any range of pressures. That, 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 that's actually a pretty wide range of pressures that you could bring it up to. But usually a very high temperature where you would expect them to react. And the value of the shock tube is that you pull it up to that state 5 almost instantaneously. You can see that our time scale on the bottom here shows that we go from the original state up to the final state in about a hundred microseconds. So that's not enough time for anything to react at this state or anywhere in this state, right? So it's essentially, as far as the chemicals are concerned, it's an instantaneous increase of temperature and pressure up to this state 5. Now I've said the words temperature and pressure a lot, but I've only shown you pressure. So let's look, let's back it all the way back up to where the driver is filled and the diaphragm is about to burst, and let's look at how temperature um, changes as we run this shock tube. You'll notice I've maintained the same rainbow color bar here, but now it goes uh, from high temperature in red to low temperature in purple. And I've basically assumed that atmospheric temperature is around 20 degrees C. So here we are, the driver is all the way full and we're just a few seconds from bursting. And now T1 is equal to T4. Unless you've heated the tube for some reason, um, your temperatures are just going to be the ambient temperature and the diaphragm bursts and the shock begins propagating and you'll notice that the gas that was just shocked and is in state 2 here in the yellow has increased in temperature the gas that is expanding back into the driver is actually decreasing in temperature a little bit because it's expanding Expand rapid expansion causes a drop in temperature so we move those that shock a little bit further down the tube and then you have those temperatures at state 1 two, three, and four again. The shock reflects back off and behind the reflected shock now we have whatever temperature we were aiming for in state five so we have T5 there. One thing to point out here about T5, uh, excuse me, you wait around to T5 for a little bit and then you get ignition. Now let's talk about this. Um, there is no temperature probe at the test section. Or a better way to say it is that you can, there's certainly now no physical temperature probe. Typically when we measure temperature, we use a thermocouple or a thermistor. But those two pieces of equipment have to have some amount of time to come into equilibrium with the gas that surrounds them in order for them to give an accurate measurement. You'll remember that this temperature goes up about in the same type of profile as the pressure, so it's only a few microseconds. That's nowhere near enough time for a thermocouple or a thermistor or any other physical temperature probe to raise up to that final temperature. And the final temperature, as I mentioned, can be as high or sometimes higher than 2500 Kelvin, that would mel melt most thermocouple probes if they had a chance to come up to equilibrium. So there's a couple reasons why you can't have a physical temperature probe. You can shoot a laser through uh, the optical test section windows and there is a possibility of determining temperature using lasers. We also have what are called the normal shock equations which we can use to predict what the temperature probably is and calculate that to a pretty high accuracy uh, based on the shock velocity and the pressure that we measure. So that's typically how we do it.
I'll talk about that in some uh, in a future video. So I've talked about pressure and temperature variations in the shock tube, but additional hydrodynamic properties that you might be interested in include the density and the Mach number. And I've uh, po I've I've found some links to some YouTube videos that are about 30 seconds long that are basically just CFD simulations of shock initiation through a few reflections of the shock wave. And so you can watch density change as a function of time throughout the tube, Mach number change throughout uh, over time throughout the tube. And then I've also posted a couple, excuse me, I've posted a link here to videos uh, from other folks of the variation in temperature and pressure from CFD simulations that should look pretty similar to what I just presented, uh, except that they're silent and don't have any description to them. So I will post these uh, links as well in the video description. This is my one reference that I used. Uh, that's where the pressure plot came from. And I hope that this was useful and told you a little bit more about shock tubes. Thanks for watching.